The TED slogan is ideas worth spreading. And today our uh, theme is thinking is contagious. So how appropriate, I am a mathematician who works on trying to understand contagious processes. So today, I'm going to try and give you a bit of a flavor of some of the things that I do and that I'm very uh, excited about, which have to do with visualizing contagious processes and using mathematical models to try and understand that. And these, uh, the models uh, that we make apply equally well to the spread of ideas, rumors or, uh, or good ideas like in TED Talks or to viral spread of YouTube videos, whatever. But I'm going to focus on what I spend most of my time doing, which is understanding infectious disease spread in human populations and trying to understand the patterns that have occurred in the past and what we can learn from them uh, about controlling disease in the future. So in order to do that, we need some solid data on what has actually happened in terms of disease spread, when cases or deaths from disease actually occurred. And let me begin by showing you a couple of, uh, of examples of work that I've done recently. So I'm sure you all remember that we had a pandemic of influenza in 2009. And this occurred around the world. And one place where we have data for it is in the province of Alberta. And what's shown here is weekly cases of laboratory confirmed cases of pandemic influenza in the province of Alberta. And the pattern is quite interesting. It started in, uh, in late April and took off, and there was a peak in June. But then it trailed off, and nothing seemed to be happening. And then there was a big outbreak again in the fall. Now, why would that happen? A lot of people said at the time, oh, well, you know, things don't spread so well in the summer. But we don't necessarily know why that might be so. And so we built a mathematical model that could try to get to the heart of the mechanisms that would give rise to this particular pattern. And one of the things that happened in June is that schools were closed for the summer. And so there's a lot less transmission, presumably, among school children. And we used a model to verify that that was actually the case. And we were able to show, moreover, that the reduction in transmission was by at least 50% because schools were closed. And that was enough to make that epidemic um, go way down. And schools opening in the fall helped to trigger that outbreak. And so that's very helpful because public health officials who are trying to plan for future pandemics want to know whether it's a good idea to close schools. And there are lots of social and economic costs to doing so. So using um, modeling to verify that these things actually do what you think is very useful. We also found that there was a, an effect of weather, but it was much smaller than the effect of closing schools. Another example, um, this should be coming up right now. There we go. Um, is a very different pattern of epidemics, this time for measles in London, England, in the second half of the 20th century. And you can see from a glance here that there was a recurrent pattern of epidemics of measles in London. So initially, in the late 1940s, there was an epidemic every single year. And then from about 1950 to 1968, strangely, it changed to every second year. There was a big epidemic. And then after 1968, the pattern of epidemics became quite irregular quite different from what had happened before until about 1990 when it seemed to just it almost disappeared. Now, why did that happen? Well, the reason that the overall number of cases went down was because of the introduction of vaccination in the 1960s. So fewer people were becoming infected. But why did the pattern change from annual to every second year to irregular behavior? That is something that we get to the bottom of using a mathematical model that allows us to formalize the mechanisms. And we were able to show that it was changes in the birth rate and then changes in the vaccination level that induced changes in the interepidemic period in a way that you would never be able to guess without using a structure that formalizes the mechanisms of disease spread. And that's very useful because we have yet to get rid of measles. And by understanding the details of the mechanisms that give rise to changes in patterns of epidemics, we might be able to design a, a, a strategy for vaccination, distribution of vaccine that could ultimately get rid of it, the ultimate goal being to bring measles to its measles, not just in North America, where we don't see it very often, but everywhere in the world, including those 
countries in Africa where it's still a substantial problem. Well, how do mathematicians actually go about making models? Well, um, what we do is we abstract and we imagine that uh, at the outset that things are a little simpler and we can divide the population into a number of simple compartments. So um, individuals who are susceptible to the disease can be infected, individuals who are currently infected and can spread the disease to others, and those who are removed from the transmission process, so they can't transmit to anybody else and can't be transmitted to, and that can happen because they recovered from being infected and are now immune, or because they died, unfortunately, from the infection. Um, and really, from the mathematical point of view, it doesn't make any difference whether they recovered or they died. It, it might make a difference to the people involved, but from the mathematical point of view, it doesn't matter because we're just trying to understand the process of spread of disease in the population. Now, we can take a picture like this and translate it into mathematical notation, into a set of equations, and there are various ways of doing that. And once we've done that, we can then solve the model and find solutions that give us an epidemic curve, such as this, which tells us the proportion of the population that's infected over time, which we can then rate, relate to the type of data that I just showed you. So this is for a single epidemic, and that's what comes out of this very simple model. And exactly the shape of this curve uh, and how high it goes depends on the rate of transmission, um, how infectious um, the um, pathogen is, and so on. So at a somewhat lower transmission rate, there's a shallower rise, and it doesn't get uh, it doesn't infect quite so many people, and uh, for a much lower transmission rate, it's a much shallower uh, climb and doesn't get to the same height. Okay, well, um, I showed you uh, data for measles in London, England. This is London, England. This is actually London Bridge, a uh, fairly recent picture of London Bridge. And one of the things that I find really exciting is that we can use mathematical models to make sense of epidemics that have occurred in the past that nobody has even looked at, but for which there are historical documents that allow us to uncover the pattern of those epidemics. And what I want to do is think more about London, but not when London Bridge looked as it does today, but when London Bridge looked like this, when it was a beautiful medieval covered bridge, an architectural masterpiece, when St. Paul's Cathedral looked like this. It doesn't look like that now because this version of St. Paul's Cathedral burned down in 1666. The city of London looked like this, very, very different from today. Now, why do I think that we might be able to understand a pattern of any epidemic that occurred uh, close to 400 years ago? It's because it's exactly this time when the city of London began a program of surveillance. Every week, they published uh, a bill of mortality that tells us the number of people who died from various causes each week. So let me show you an example of that. Here is one bill of mortality from a particular week in 1665. And if I zoom in on the left-hand page, there are some interesting things that you see. The causes of death, which are listed alphabetically. So somebody died of being frightened to death. Uh, three people died of grief. We don't usually see that as a cause of death in, in uh, today's uh, mortality records. A bunch of people died from griping in the guts, and there are various other interesting things here. But most impressively, in this one week, there were more than 5,000 people who died from plague. This was in the middle of the Great Plague of London, and that's what I want to spend a number of minutes thinking about right now. Now, plague has a bad rep, and you've probably seen images like this of what it must have been like to be in a place where there was a plague epidemic and the horrible things, it really horrendous conditions that people had to deal with. But it's not that horror of the, of the disease that I want to think. I want to think about what was the pattern of contagion? What was the pattern of spread throughout the population? And that we can do by piecing together the data that we get from these bills of mortality. And when we do that, we get exactly this picture for the Great Plague of London, which shows an initial, essentially exponential rise and then turnover, just the sort of pattern that we've seen uh, in many modern epidemics, in each of the individual epidemics that I showed you in the more recent data at the beginning. And if we think about our mathematical model, by considering different possible transmission rates and recovery rates, we can actually fit a model to this. And remarkably, just 
uh, a transmission rate and a recovery rate, and this sensible, perhaps seemingly naive model is enough to give us an impression that we actually can understand that pattern of this epidemic of the Great Plague of London. And once we've done that, then we're in a really strong position because we have a model that seems to explain the character and structure of an epidemic, and we can then change things within the model to ask questions about what would have happened if we could have intervened in some way. For example, suppose that uh, a vaccine had been invented, maybe not a great vaccine, maybe only 5% of the population could have been protected by this vaccine. How would that have affected the Great Plague of London? Well, it would have looked like this. It would have been had a shallower rise. The peak of the epidemic wouldn't have been as high. Fewer people would have died. Fewer people would have been infected. And we can do exactly this type of thing with any model that we have fit to a data set to ask, how would we deal with this disease if it were to invade the population again? How can we use how can we design better control strategies? And we can investigate those control strategies with mathematical models using a computer in order to converge on ideas that will help us to reduce the impact of disease. Now, the bills of mortality have a second page, and that second page is really exciting. So let me, let me blow that up a bit. So here what we have is a list of each of the 130 parishes of London 130 parishes within a tiny city of a couple of square miles. And for each parish, they listed the total number of people who died and the total number of people who died from plague specifically. So what does that mean? It means that we have a spatial record on a very small scale, a divided into 130 regions on a tiny city, and we can follow the spatial spread of the Great Plague of London. And this information has been buried in these documents sitting in the Guildhall Library in London for centuries. Nobody has looked at this. What does it look like? What was the pattern, the spatial spread pattern of the Great Plague of London? Incidentally, that, the bill that I focused on was typewritten. Most of the bills are actually handwritten, but to my delight, they, are, were, they had beautiful handwriting. And so we've had no trouble actually translating these data into something that can be represented on a computer. So here is London again. The map of London is gray in the background. The wall of London is highlighted in yellow. London Bridge is, is this uh, heavy black line. And what I'm going to do is go through each of the, um, uh, I'm going to color the parishes in the order in which they were infected. That is, the order in which somebody was noted as having died of plague in 1665. So it's, and as I do this, ask yourself whether there's evidence for spatial spread. It's not obvious there would be. This is a tiny, uh, city, perhaps it spread everywhere immediately. What do we see? It started outside the walls, and within a few weeks, it had made it near the, the wall, uh, near, the, near London Bridge, and also to a gate, near a gate at the northeast corner of the city. And as the weeks passed on, it penetrated the walls and continued to penetrate the city slowly over the course of months. So week by week, encroaching on the very center of the city. And it may not seem that it was completely smooth, but remember, these are weekly mortality records. And sometimes somebody would have died uh, before somebody who was infected earlier. So I think there's actually very strong evidence for a wave of this epidemic encroaching on the center of the city. And that is a pattern that we've only discovered recently. This initial pattern of spatial spread um, is only one aspect of the dynamics of the Great Plague of London. And I'm now going to show you, this is a movie of the Great Plague again. And the initial spatial spread is already happening, but you don't see it, okay? Because all of that happened in the early part of 1665. And the really dramatic part of, uh, of the epidemic is starting to happen now, where these cylinders indicating the number of people dying in each of the parishes are starting to rise. And you'll see that through the summer now, and as we get further into the uh, August and September, it really was very dramatic. It was raging everywhere in this city. Now, we can also build mathematical models to try and understand these detailed spatial data. And that gives us a great deal of power in terms of understanding how we might be able to learn how to control plague if it happened to enter a city like this again, or similar diseases that spread in human populations now. We can learn so much from these data. And it's a, although these are 
350 years old, it's actually not so easy to get hold of the type of minute spatial scale data that we have here. Incidentally, you can see that for a whole year after the epidemic raged, it continued to smolder in the population. And that is also very interesting in trying to understand that smoldering and how that affects our ability to actually ultimately wipe out uh, a disease can be very important for managing disease uh, epidemics in the future. Another thing that we learn from, from fitting models to these data um, is that we can study, we can actually infer the contact patterns among individuals in the population because only for certain uh, contact patterns can we actually fit a model that reproduces something like the epidemic that we've seen. Well, um, you might say, I'm talking about plague, what is plague? In the 19th century, historians thought that it was bubonic plague. That's only been verified in the last couple of years by my colleague Hendrik Poiner and his collaborators here at McMaster University, who succeeded in sequencing the genome of the pathogen that caused the Black Death, an earlier plague epidemic, in the 14th century in London. Okay? This, is a, this was a plague pit in London. And we actually do have some data from the Black Death era, but it's much cruder and it's based on last wills and testaments of wealthy individuals. We can still study that, but it's harder to get uh, the detailed information that we can about the Great Plague. We've also actually digitized the entire sequence of the bills of mortality from 1662 up to 1930. And one of my PhD students, Olga Krolova, spent her thesis working on smallpox epidemics over 250 years in London. And if you look at this, if I blow up the uh, the first region uh, of this graph, and then the, the second region, there's tremendous change in the character of the epidemics. And so, for example, here, it changes from very frequent epidemics to much less frequent epidemics, and it turns out that this is correlated with vaccination becoming free in London. And so the uptake of vaccine was much higher. But we, using mathematical models, were able to predict precisely when this should have happened based on the amount of vaccine uh, that people were using in the population. There is so much that we can learn by uncovering the detailed pictures of these old epidemics and then using mathematical models to get at the mechanisms that give rise to the different patterns that have occurred in the past. So the TED conferences are about spreading ideas. Thinking is contagious, and I want to leave you with a thought in that connects this to the types of infectious disease contagion that I've been talking about. And that's that contagious thinking actually affects the process of infectious disease spread. If you think about, and we talked a bit about vaccination, well, you make a decision of whether or not to be vaccinated, whether or not to vaccinate your children. And, the, and those decisions uh, actually spread in populations because a vaccine scares people back off all those things actually affect the epidemic dynamics. Those are things that we can actually put into models of infectious disease spread as well in order to inform public health decisions about not only about how to distribute vaccine, but how to educate the public, for example, in ways that might reduce the spread of disease in the future. And we have a tremendous opportunity coming up. I said that the, the Great Plague is an example where we have detailed spatial data. But these days, we're collecting extraordinary data. We're all carrying around smartphones that know exactly where we are at all, all times. As time goes on, we're going to be able to build up data that allow us to look at the spread of disease in human populations in a, in a kind of detail that has never been possible. And that will allow us to get to many of the mechanisms uh, that drive infectious disease spread and design better control strategies in the future. Thanks. <laughs>